All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, let's get started with today's class. So the first thing that I want to do is just revisit some of the concepts of what we saw last week on the linear and nonlinear regression. Um, you know, I, I think I got some questions that that prompted me to kind of take a step back and expand a little bit more on some of those topics. So after we do that, we're going to get into our iteration exercise, which is going to be the next coding exercise we're going to be doing here. It's more of a data science related topic. How do we um, automate and iterate through different uh, tasks in R? All right, so um, I guess I the first thing is I just wanted to show you again the, the schedule for our our course. Um, I added here a few reading uh, resources for you, especially on the side of the regression and optimum finding part one and two. So there's going to be a couple of reading uh, reading links and resources. The first one here, uh, it's a paper that. It's not only regression models and applications of agricultural research. So this uh, is a paper that um, the these these authors here are really well known researchers out of Iowa State, and they do a lot of work in modeling and statistics. Uh, so they do have here a workflow of how we would go about using nonlinear models, which for the most part are things that we did in our workflow. Um, and they also have here a whole bunch of different types of nonlinear models. We really only explore one of these models that was the linear plateau, but they go through a whole bunch of them, um, the formula, how, how we would implement them, um, and really go into more detail on that. There's no way that in this course we, we can cover all of these different types of models. This is something that I wanted to expose you on the coding side, how we would implement one of those models. And now, you know, if you if you have specific needs for your research, uh, you can use other resources to learn how to do that. This would be more on the theoretical side of things, how we would do it. And then one of the co-authors of this paper here, Fernando Miguez, um, he developed a package, which the second reading material here, if you open that, it's the GitHub repo for this his package that's called NLRAA. It was one of the packages we used during the last coding exercise to fit one of those functions, uh, the, the linear plateau one. But this package here, there's a lot of documentation, there's videos, there's different vignettes and tutorials that you can follow to see how you would implement some of the functions on that paper, but in R, right? So if you do need to go a little bit deeper on the, on the, on the paper and also on the code side of things, these are two great resources that I wanted to point um, point in, in your direction. All right, so, you know, last class, um, I noticed that perhaps some of the concepts as far as what do these estimates that we're calculating really mean? How do we interpret them? Um, I guess we had a little bit of a conversation about that, but I decided to create a lecture to expand a little bit on that. So uh, we have more foundation on understanding these models. So what I want to do now is go through this lecture here that is actually under the March 14th class. The link is under that uh, that that class period. But if you just go there and launch this, uh, it's again going to be one of those HTML presentations that you can download and take notes uh, as a PDF if you wish. Uh, but we're just going to go through these, these slides here uh, before we move on to the iteration exercise. Okay, so, so here, you know, perhaps this lecture would have been best fit before the actual exercise that we did. Uh, but anyways, it's coming now. So I hope that you can still make the connections between what we saw in the exercise and some of the concepts. And I do bring the data we worked in the, in the exercise here as well. So we look at that and interpret things um, applied to the example that we saw. So the goals of this uh, presentation here is gonna to be to explore the mathematical formula, the implementation and the interpretation uh, of linear and nonlinear regression models applied for finding optimal levels in agriculture. So the models are gonna be the same as the ones that we saw uh, in the coding exercise that we're gonna see here in a second. 
So we talked about this as far as, you know, this is just a very basic concept of what regression is, but it's really a method for feeding a line of some sort to data where the relationship between at least two variables, X and Y, where both of those variables are numerical, right? So we talked about the fact that if your X variables, so your explanatory variables are categorical, then you're running analysis of variance. However, if you have both your X and Y being quantitative variables, so numerical variables, then you're running regression. And then again, we saw these, these scenarios here in the, in the coding exercise where um, this relationship between X and Y can take many different forms. I am just bringing here to you four of them, which were the ones that explored with the code. So here we have the intercept only, the linear, quadratic, the linear plateau, of the relationship between seating rate in thousand seats per hectare and yield. So we talked about here, especially if we are referring to, if we're using these methods to estimate the optimum level of, in this case, seating rate that optimizes yield, you know, how our interpretation would change depending on which one of these models is the best fit to your data. And again, we talked about that it could be very easily uh, depending on what is your input that you're that you're assessing, that in one year your study will give an optimal rate that will behave like the intercept model, and in the next year maybe you have something like the quadratic model. So this response here may change for different sites, for different years, and especially as you are also evaluating different input variables, which in this case is in rates, but it could be you know, fertilizer rates, pesticide rates, really anything that has a rate component to it. All right, so now I want to take each one of these models and just expand a little bit on the understanding of what those estimates mean and how we interpret them as well. So beginning here with model one, the intercept only model, right? So the intercept only model has this formula here, where again, Y in our case is yield. Um, and really, if you notice, there is no there's no X information here. So there's no seating rate information here, basically just meaning that our model is gonna be just beta zero, which in this case here, beta zero is the intercept. Or in these types of models, you can also think of it as the overall mean of the response variable. And then of course, in every error, we have some, some in every model, we have some residual error. This is just being depicted by the, the epsilon symbol there. So this is how that would look like, right? We saw this again in the example, in the overall example in the beginning uh, that I just showed you. And now I wanna implement this with the data that we run in class. So we, we kind of bring that concept back to a data set we're more familiar with. This out of the way. So uh, this is just, what I'm gonna sh be showing you next is just um, this model being applied to the data we use in class. Uh, this is the statistical summary of the estimates of the model. If you were to go back to our scripts, you would find exactly the same output where the only uh, estimate of this model, again, is that intercept, which was estimated at 12.2. So this is the plot of what we saw in class. So we have here sitting rate on the x-axis, yield on the y-axis, and really this beta zero here of 12.2, this, this is the actual model, right? It's just predicting a consistent yield regardless of sitting rate. This is beta zero. That value is coming from right there, right? So that estimate that we get from the model summary is this estimate here on the y-axis. What's the, what's the value on the y-axis <clears throat> regardless of the value of the x-axis. So really the way that we would interpret this is that yield is gonna be, you know, in this case here, 12.2 megagrams per hectare, regardless of seeding rates. This is how we would interpret this model parameter, beta zero, which again, in this model, it only has that beta zero estimate parameter. It doesn't have any other uh, estimated parameters for us to, to look at. We did realize, I guess, just even just looking at the points on this plot here, that this is probably not the best fitting model, right? So then we went ahead and fitted different models, which I'm going to be showing you next, and how we would interpret those models that come after. 
All right, so now if we move on to the linear model, uh, and again, I just want to make the distinction here, we're calling this linear to mean a model that has an intercept and a slope. However, models one, two, and three are considered linear models. So the intercept, the linear, and the quadratic are all linear models. That terminology comes from the interpretation of the parameters. The parameters of these models are all linear. The only nonlinear model, and again, because of the parameters being nonlinear, is the linear plateau model. I'm going to get to that. But anyways, we're just using this nomenclature here of calling this linear, but really meaning intercept and slope model. So the intercept plus slope model will look like this, where we have again a beta zero plus a beta one times X plus the error. So here we would be explaining why it would be yield. Then we have an intercept beta zero, a slope beta one that is multiplied by X plus an error associated with it. So the interpretation here of these parameters, again, the beta zero is gonna be your intercept. So basically where this line cuts through the y-axis when x equals zero, we're gonna talk about this in a second here. And then the slope is gonna be beta one. And the slope really represents a change in y. So a change in yield for each unit change on x. So a change on yield for each one unit change in sitting rate in our case, right? Let's look into applying this model to our data. Well, I guess this is how the overall relationship will look like for a data that fits well with that model. And now let's look into implementing this to our data set. So here again, this is the estimate table from our model. If you were to go back to the code, you would see these exact terms right there. So what we see here is an intercept of eight in a slope depicted by the sitting rate as 0 0.052. So these are beta zero and beta one. This is how R gives that back to us. And this is what that really means. So here in our data, really in class, I guess we only made maps that stopped at 40 sitting rate because that was the minimum. So we did not expand this X axis to show the zero. But really, the, the intercept here, again, is whenever your x equals to 0, so whenever sitting rate is equals to 0, what point on the y-axis you're cutting through. So if we just extended this range here on the x-axis to include 0, and we see where this predicted line cuts through the y-axis, this right here is 8.02. And I hope you can see that on the, on the axis here. Right, So that's what our estimate of intercept has given us, is where this line cuts through the y-axis when x equals to zero. And then our slope, our beta one in this case, is just the, the slope of change of, or, or the, the this, I guess the speed of change of yield for each one unit increase in sitting rates. So the slope here is 0 0.05, is just represented by how the angle sort of, of this line, right? So the faster something, the faster Y changes according to changes in X, the steeper this slope would be, the slow that it changes, the, the flatter this line would be. So this is just that, that change. The way that we would interpret this is that, so I guess to begin with here, in this case here, if our sitting rate equals to zero, this model would predict a yield of eight, um, in this case here, eight megagrams of grain per hectare. In this specific case, we know that is not biologically possible because if you don't plant any seeds, you don't have any plants to harvest. However, if this x-axis variable was something else, for example, fertilizer rates, or maybe pesticide rates, or something else that is not seeding rate, you, you could very well have still have eel levels even when you apply nothing of that input, right? So imagine if you're working with nitrogen fertilizer, it could be that, I mean, you're still gonna get some yield if you apply no nitrogen fertilizer or potassium fertilizer for that matter, right? So you still get something. That is what this intercept here means is if you apply zero of your input rate, which is on our x-axis, how much yield on the y-axis you get. In our case here, it would be estimating to be eight megagrams per hectare. And then uh, for the slope here, 
the way that we would interpret this is that for each one unit increase in seeding rate, you would expect an increase in yield of 0 0.052 megagrams per hectare, right? So that's how we would interpret these two coefficients for this model. So both the intercept and the slope of this model. And in this case, apply to the example we saw in class. Any questions about this? All right, let's move on to the next model then. So the next one is the quadratic model. So the quadratic model, so I hope you're noticing how on the intercept only model, we only have beta zero. On the intercept plus slope, we have beta zero and beta one. Now on this model, on the quadratic model, we have a beta zero, beta one, and beta two, where beta zero is still gonna be our intercept. So whenever X equals zero, Imagine that if X equals zero, it cancels out beta one, it cancels out beta two, you only end up with beta zero, right? So that is gonna be your intersect or your intercept, I'm sorry. In this case here, beta one and beta two, they are really just the coefficients associated with, in this case, beta one with the linear uh, or just with X. So in this case, with seating rate as is, and then with the, with the seating rate is squared, would be associated with beta two. And in the case of the quadratic uh, relationship, it's a little bit more difficult to interpret beta one and beta two straight off the bat, like we were doing with the linear one, uh, just because these parameters, they, they're gonna, they're gonna, the way they impact Y is a little bit different. So really, if you think about it, uh, the rate of change, which would be, be related to that slope. So for each, unit change in beta one plus two beta two, uh, you get, sorry, so you change yield uh, for each unit that you change in X in this proportion here. So it's, just, it's not just the slope anymore, but it's the relationship between the slope and so beta one and beta two, where we, kind of, we refer to beta one as still being the slope and beta two being the curvature but it's not a direct relationship now between slope and yield. There's a relationship of both beta one and beta two on yield when we think about that, that change. And this would be uh, what we would, the way we would see this plot, right? So you have this curvature in our case here, it's, it's increasing, reaching a point of maximum and then decreasing, but it could be the opposite. I guess, you know, if you are measuring something that Maybe you are, opt in our case, optimum is highest, but maybe it could be a situation where optimum was actually the lowest, right? So I don't know, maybe if you're trying to minimize something, you would be fitting a quadratic curve that hopefully would have a different shape, it would be like a U shape rather than a bell shape. And if we bring this to our example in class, this would be the parameters that were estimated. So the beta zero here of minus 0 0.97, our, the, I guess the linear component of this quadratic response estimated as 0 0.3 and the quadratic uh, component of that estimated as minus 0 0.0016. So this would be beta, beta zero, beta one, beta two for our, for our model. And then really, you know, even though I'm trying to give you some understanding of, of how we, we would visualize these parameters, uh, but still, again, it's not, in the quadratic case, it's not exactly straightforward like this, but you can kind of think, again, as your beta zero, if you were to extend this, this curve fit to include when x equals zero, that's where your beta zero would be. So this is just below zero, right? So just barely negative. Your beta one gives us some indication of this relationship here, if it's either increasing or decreasing. So beta one being positive, it means that it is increasing. In this case here, that is 0 0.31 coming from our estimate of this model. And then our beta two is about that curvature of this, of this, uh, of this model. So in this case here, a negative beta two is associated with a curvature that makes your line looks like a bell shape. If this curvature is positive, then you get like a U-shape type of fit. 
So really, you know, interpreting this model again is not as straightforward as we had on the previous ones, but what we can tell about it is that in this case, yield here is positively related to seeding rate. And if we wanted to use our, our coefficients to understand that, that's because beta one is greater than zero. So beta one here being 0 0.3, so positively related. If it would have been negative, beta one would have been negative as well with a point of maximum. Right, so that's because our beta two here is less than zero. It is a negative value beta two. We know it's reaching a point of maximum. If beta two would have been positive, then this was would have been curved the other way around. So it would be like a U shape where we actually have a point of minimum rather than a point of maximum. And here I'm just you know giving some context. It looks like it's about using this model here. The optimum would be somewhere you know around here, so I'm just saying around 90,000 seats per hectare. So again, my goal here was to bring these models through the formula, show you what coefficients we're estimating and connecting that with the data that we saw in class. So we better create this, this understanding of the estimates of the model and how they actually look like when we interpret them. And then the last one here was the linear plateau. So again, this, of the four that we looked into, this is the only nonlinear model. And this is why. So whenever you would explain, well, at least a, not a linear plateau model, you would explain some, some, somewhat like this, where you have a condition, right? So the condition here is that if X, in our case, X is sitting rate. So if sitting rate is less than the breakpoint, if you remember XS is the breakpoint, then this is the formula that you would apply to the data. So it would basically be a intercept plus slope formula where you have an intercept and a slope changing as a function of seating rate. However, if your seating rate is greater than the breakpoint, then this becomes this formula here, where now instead of having X uh, applied to your, to your slope, you just have the fixed value of XS. Right. So you have this condition here that makes the function fit what we would be expecting to see in a linear plateau model where it increases linearly until a point. That point is XS. After that point, it becomes constant. So this is the mathematical notation of that. So again, the same interpretations as before, beta zero being our intercept. So if we set X to zero, beta zero is where our, um, our, our yield level when seeding rate is zero. Our slope remains the change in, in yield for each unit change in, in seeding rate until the breakpoint, right? In this case here, this slope is until the breakpoint. And then in this case here, breakpoint is that XS parameter, which is the X axis value where yield is optimized. Right, so this would be that point right there uh, that we found on our curve. And this is how overall will look like, right? So beta zero would still be, if you keep extending this to include zero on the x-axis, this is what beta zero would cut through is the, is the intercept. You have this slope here, which is beta one, and xs is the seeding, is in this case, a seeding rate level after which yield plateaus. And then applying this to our data, these were the coefficients that we got in our exercise. When we did this exercise, these were called A, B, and XS, but really A here is beta zero, B is beta one, XS is the breakpoint. This is how they look like. So again, if I take that, the, the model that we fit and extend that until zero on the X axis, beta zero is where it cuts on the y-axis, right? So 3.46 here, the estimator from the model, you can see how that cuts right below four on the y-axis. That's what the beta zero means. The slope here is the same. So it's changing. Uh, so yield is changing for each unit increase in seeding rate, yield is changing in 0 0.14 megagrams per hectare until the break point. Right, and the break point here was estimated to be at 33.5 seeds or 1,000 seeds per hectare, right? So this 
the breakpoint estimate is reflected on the x-axis. Remember that it's not on the y-axis, it's on the x-axis. After reach point, there's no response of yield anymore to seeding rate. So the way that we would interpret this is that yield is increasing linearly as seeding rate increases. And we know that because our beta one here is positive, is greater than zero. If beta zero were, were to be negative, then yield would be decreasing with as you increase in rates. And that happens until a threshold, right, of that break point. So in our case here, the break point was 73.5. We see that on our model estimate. We see that's where, if we were to project this on the x-axis, that's about where it would be as well. After which point, after so after this break point here, then yield is not changing anymore. It reached a plateau and it just remains fixed. Okay, so these were this is basically what I wanted to show you on this lecture, just to give you a little bit more understanding of the models we were running, what those coefficients meant, and connected those coefficients with the graphical interpretation of these plots as well. And I think, let's see, I think I just have a, a summary here. Yeah, this is pretty much what I had for this, for this lecture before we move to the iteration exercise. And I do want to take a moment here and open up for questions. If this was confusing, if you still have questions, I'll be glad to talk about that. Yes. So my question is like, uh, do we have to pick one of the best models based on our parameters or do we have to run all of them? So what we did, the way we did in class and the way this is normally done is you would run from the simplest model, which is the intercepts and you start running consecutively more complicated models. In our case here, if you think about it, intercept only is only beta zero. The intercept plus slope is beta zero plus beta one. Quadratic beta zero, beta one, beta two. And in this case, your linear plateau, we change a little bit the understanding of the parameters, but it's basically beta zero, beta one and a break point. So we fit the models that, at least for your discipline, you know, make sense. And then we use AIC to select the best model, like we did in class, right? So in class, I don't know if you remember, but we ran all these four models and then we compared them using AIC. The one with the lowest AIC was the linear plateau one, indicating it was the one with the best fit. And then we used that uh, to extract what was our optimum which in this case here is very easy because the linear plateau model, one of the parameters is actually the optimum rate. So it's really easy. You don't have to do any extra work to get that optimum uh, level of signal rate here. But yeah, we always want to compare because especially, you know, so when it comes to fertilizer response or signal rate response, these models are some of the most common ones. But this may change depending on discipline. I know that if you look into the documentation of the package and on the paper they published, I think they show models for like plant growth or growth rate, something like that, where you would use different nonlinear models to model that type of behavior. So, you know, you would, I guess, select the models you know are most appropriate for what you're studying. And that would be something you get from the literature um, of like which types of models are most common to describe that type of data. And then from that point on, you fit, you know, the ones that make sense, select the one that has the best fit and use that to estimate your optimum points. So I know that on that paper that I showed earlier, for example, I know, I mean, they have many nonlinear functions there. Some are very applied towards like soil water dynamics. Others may be more applied to plant growth and plant parameters. So there's different disciplines there uh, that, you know, I would recommend that you look into your specific discipline and find those models to try. Yes. I'm going to ask a question. Maybe it's not a very relevant position, but if I wanted to compare, you know, the slopes on like two different videos in like, mm -hmm. for example, in this figure that we have, maybe it might not be a good idea to put it in the linear computer model. Instead, in the linear model, you can think about the linear model that we have. Mm -hmm. If you also add it, for example, for by the rate, we mm -hmm. would have four different figures that we and for each by the rate. So if I wanted to compare the slopes of those four different figures in line, mm -hmm. compare the solution that you give. I believe there's some reason that you're talking about these solutions 
Yeah. 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 So here, so the question, so let's say, I guess, like if we go back to our example initially that we have potassium and nitrogen rate in the same study, right? And you wanted to estimate these. Yeah. So we had we had this conversation briefly pre on the previous class, but if you, so the thing here is that um, if you do have at least two two inputs that you're changing the rates and you're trying to find the overall global optimum of both of them together. Um, there are some models called respawn surface models that are specifically for that. Uh, normally, I mean, you can apply, as long as you have all combinations of levels of the two different input levels, you can run these types of models. They are best suited if you actually plan ahead and you design your study already thinking of that design because if you don't, you, you, the model may not converge. So if you already know that you wanna, let's say you have two or three different inputs that you wanna change the levels and find the overall optimum level of all three together, um, you would run models like that and plan your studies accordingly in a way that you select the levels of all three in a way that optimizes the chance of convergence. I know that was a mouthful, but that would be one way that people do with it is we're using those types of models. Um, I guess another way perhaps of what you're saying, so those models, they basically do that. They, they, they look into the main effects and then the interaction terms of these continuous variables. That's what the model is doing for you, but the, the workflow of respawn surface models is, is a little bit more structured in a way that you can really test if that response is linear, is quadratic, and, and really has a flow for you to understand that better. If you don't go that route completely, but you just wanna have in this model here, let's say yield explained by nitrogen rate, potassium rate in the interaction, you can still learn something from that, um, that relationship um, doing, Go, doing that way. And then if if you do have differences in the significance of the interaction, especially, then it probably means, and, and of course, it, here, if you think about it, you're going to have an interaction of the intercept of the linear term. So let me use this nomenclature here. You're going to have an interaction. I mean, you should model the interaction of the beta zero, beta one, and beta two on a quadratic model, if you think about it, so in a way that you're allowing for those parameters to change for all the levels of your nitrogen potassium rates. Now, if they come back as, if one or more of them come back as non-significant, it means that they're not changing significantly across different levels. So you could use at least one or more of them as just one parameter estimated and then looking at the others. Yeah. So when you think back, so when you discuss that, your first exercise when you, when you have the reaction, mm -hmm. you compare all the groups. And then, yeah. this case, it's going to be true. And compare different nitrogen and part three. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that, 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 that's a good point. So, yeah, just, just rephrasing what Anis was saying. So, if you do have, so if you run a model where you have interacting terms where both of those factors or both of those variables are numerical, right? You would have you would be testing to see if beta zero, beta one, and beta two in the case of the quadratic, if those parameters are different or not across your different levels or across your different factors as far as nitrogen and, and potassium. So if there is a significant difference, then it means you should extract those coefficients separately for each one of those levels. Uh, and if there's not a significant difference, then you would just not do not break down the interaction, right? And then that's how you would you would also do this. I don't. I did not plan for us to do that type of exercise. But if it's something that you're running to um, and you have issues, let me know. I can I can uh, try to help you there. All right. Any other questions about about these? Okay, um, so just a quick summary here, you know, I just wanted to show you again the mathematical formula, the implementation, and also the interpretation of these different regression models uh, that included both linear and nonlinear types. So hopefully this was helpful for you to understand better what we did in the exercise um, and how that, how we would interpret those models as well.
And of course, on the exercise, we use AIC to select the best model and then use only that model to get an estimate of the optimum. All right, so that was what I wanted to talk with you about in relation to the regression uh, exercise. Now, the next thing that we're gonna do is the, at least begin our iteration exercise. So for that, you would have to do a, well, I guess two steps. I hope that you're already getting used to these. You're gonna have to do a git pull because I uploaded two files in the data folder or two data files and one partial script file for us to work with. Once you do the git pull on your 2024 DSA, I do ask you that you create a GitHub repo for this exercise specifically. The way that I would like for you to call that, uh, let me pull mine here to make sure we're matching, is 08 underscore iteration. So when you go to GitHub, you create a new repo on your account, you call that 08 underscore iteration. Let me pull up again some of the initial steps at least so we can we can see what to do there. So this would be the first steps at least that you would do. So we go to your GitHub repo or your GitHub account, create a 04, I'm sorry, 08 underscore iteration. You don't need a description, make it public add a readme file, add a git ignore for R, and then create the repository. After that, you click on that call button, choose HTTPS and copy that path. And then you launch any R Studio window um, and go through these steps here of first file, new project, version control, and git. On the repository URL, you paste what you just copied from GitHub. You can leave blank the project directory name. And then where it asks create project as subdirectory of, you browse to the main folder of this course. So that would be the one that you already seen all the previous projects that you had and then you create a project. Once you do that, as you already know, um, it will launch this RStudio window for you. And And then what you need to do is create those subfolders, code, data, and output. On the 08 iteration uh, project that you just created. Um, so for the, as you're moving stuff from the 2024 DSA to the 08 iteration, the code is just one, so I have three, but you're only going to have one. That's going to be the 0318 iteration partial. So move that script into the code folder of this project. On the data side, I want you to move two files. So one of them is called nematode underscore rs. The other one is called site.png. Move both of those from 2024 DSA data to the data fold subfolder of 08 iteration. Once you do that, you should see something somewhat similar to mine. Of course, I have a couple of extra files that you don't, but you would you should have the 08 underscore iteration folder. When you go inside of that folder, you should have that R proj that was created already for you once you did the new project. Inside of code, you should have the partial code that I just shared. Inside data, you should have nematode RS and site as well. Good. 
just want to give you a quick moment here to catch up. All right, I'm going to get started here. If anyone needs more time, please feel free to let me know. I can wait another moment. But if not, we're going to keep moving. All right, so I don't hear anything. Let me increase my font size. As always, if you need your outline, uh, to navigate, you can do that here. And we're going to start from the top. OK, so I do have a lot of, uh, you know, what, what I've been trying to do when I develop these scripts is to give a lot of comments on the script, which are normally the things I talk about, you know, in class. But for your own studying material, uh, you can refer to, to that text as well. Let's see, I had a chat comment here. I cannot find. So Kriti, the BD file, you don't need that. Uh, that was more, that was on my site only. So what you really need on the data folder is going to be the nematode underscore rs and the site.png. Awesome. Okay, so in this exercise here, I want to expose you to three concepts in I guess it's more data, it's not specifically to statistical programming, but it's more perhaps a data science type of approaches. Let's see, yeah. Um, where we're gonna be talking about functions, loops, and list mapping. Let me, let me maybe, especially here in Athens, I can see you, your faces more easily. Um, who here has experience writing functions? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, two people, three people. What about working with loops, like for loops, while loops? Couple people, all right. If you've been working um, in R, maybe you've heard of the package per, which is part of the tidyverse, and doing iteration instead of through loops, doing that using lists and mapping over lists. Anyone has experience with that? Okay, a, a couple people. That's awesome, that's awesome. It means that a lot of you are gonna hopefully learn a lot of new tricks in this exercise. Okay, so um, so here in the, we're gonna be basically exploring these three concepts. One of them is writing functions, writing your own functions. So up until now, we've been using functions, right? So every single thing that has a name and is followed by a parenthesis, opening parentheses, and at some point closes the parentheses, is a function, right? We've been using a lot of functions that other people developed. Today, we're gonna see some easy examples of how you can create your own function. What is this, the semantics of creating a function and how that works? Then we're gonna get into loops. So loops and list mapping are two ways that we can iterate over a task. So for example, if you, if you think about it on our on the on the experimental design data we've been working with, we had so yield impacted by um, nitrogen rate, potassium rate, and their interaction, right? For one site, one year. Let's say that you you know started your program and your your advisor already had this data collected for fifty site years. How can you do the whole workflow? that we did for one side year. Now, how can you do for 50 side years? Myself, when I was just starting learning uh, how to program in R, I would basically just take that my script, copy that, paste that script, and just change the data coming in and have 50 scripts. Please don't do that. <laughs> that is not very reproducible. That will, I mean, of course, you know, if we don't know how to do things differently, that's what we do, that's what we resort to. But that is not the most, it's definitely not the most efficient. It's not the most reproducible. Now imagine if you're on site 45 and you realize, oh, I have a something in my code I should have changed. So you go back to all the previous 45 scripts, make that small change, 
run all of them again. So you can see how very small things that you realize you could have done differently, better. Uh, if it comes to that, if you're using that approach, it becomes very irreproducible. It's difficult to keep track of what you're doing and what script, which ones you're not doing something. So we're gonna see an alternative to that, which is again, using loops or list mapping, which the idea here is if you have a task that's repetitive, that you're just changing the input, but the process is the same, we can use loops and in this case, list mapping to automate those steps and just change the data coming in, but the code of the workflow once the data goes in remains the same. Okay, so this exercise here is adapted from a paper that I was a co-author uh, where we were, this is the paper, this is the link if you're interested in looking into more details. We're not gonna be reproducing the analysis of the paper itself, but if you do want more background, you can read the paper. But pretty much this paper here evaluated the potential of predicting nematode damage. And the, the way that we, that we represented that in the data was to get nematode counts um, using drone-based remote sensing metrics for soybeans. So the way that this study was conducted is the paper had three sites. I'm just showing you one of those three sites where we had 43 georeference soil and plant samples from this field here. Each point is a, is a place where, uh, where we sampled. So the student that took the samples went to this field pulled a soil, or I guess they use a shovel to pull some more soil around the roots. So they collected five soybean samples and their root systems, and also the soil around those the, the, the roots, so the rhizosphere, and then analyzed both the soil and the roots for nematode counts. So what they did here was they sent these soil and plant samples to a nematode lab where they analyze those samples for three species of nematode. Here are their names. And in parentheses is the um, short, short name of their names that we're gonna be seeing in the data frame. That's why it happened here. Just so we remember that male PB and HET are just different species of nematodes that were uh, measured on these samples. So the goal here was to go to this field, take these ground truth samples, and then fly a drone the same day that the samples were collected and try to see if there's any signal in the drone imagery data that we can relate to the different levels of nematode infestation of different, different spots of this field. So that was the goal. From the imagery side, uh, so this was a multispectral sensor. If you're not familiar with that, don't worry too much. But all that, that you need to know is that the sensor gives you five variables, which is the reflectance on different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Those regions are called red, green, blue, mean for red, and red edge. And in parentheses here, I have the acronym of how these, these variables are going to be coded in the data, just so you have the reference as well. So. <clears throat> Let's see, I don't think I mentioned that yet, but so we had here, um, we had 10 nematode related variables that were collected at each one of these of the samples that includes different species of nematode, uh, if it was from soil or if it was from the, the plant roots. We have five original bands from the multispectral data. So these were the ones we just saw above, these five. And then we use those bands to combine into 10 different vegetation indices. If you're not familiar with remote sensing, vegetation indices are just different ways that we combine the original bands that may be better correlated with certain plant characteristics. So for that then, in total, we had so 10 nematode response variables, and then 15 because five bands plus 10 vegetation indices, um, variables related to the sensor data. Now, my goal here is that, that, let me tell the first division that I have for this, and then we're gonna start developing this. So my goal is to first off calculate, so right now we just have the band information, right? So we have 
this information here, we do not have the information on the vegetation indices, which again, we're going to calculate that ourselves uh, as different combinations of these original bands. So the, the first goal here is gonna be to calculate different vegetation indices using these original bands. And then for each one of the 10 nematode response variables, I wanna run a bivariate model where I have one of those nematode response variables explained by one of the sensor data. So this could be a given bend, could be a given vegetation index, but just in a bivariate relationship. If this is not a multivariate exercise, it's just, for example, it would be number of, the, of this name here of the nematode species in the roots explained by reflectance on the green band. So it's Y is gonna be, the Y of our formula is going to be that nematode related variable. The X is going to be one sensor variable at a time. Because I want to do this, then my, my final goal is to run all these models, which is going to account for 150 models that we're going to run. And then for each one of these nematode variables, I want to only keep the model with the sensor data that was able to create the largest R square for that nematode variable, okay? So imagine that we take one nematode variable here, let's say that was again, the number of the, the low, well, whatever the name is spelled uh, in the roots explained by each one of the sensor variables, which are 15. So for each one of the Y variables here, for each one of the nematode related variables, I'm gonna have 15 models where each one of them is gonna be one of the different bands and or vegetation indices. And then for that Y variable in specific, I just wanna keep the highest R square model. So we're gonna do that. Overall, we're gonna be running 150 models and then selecting the, the 10 where each one of those is gonna be the best model for a given Y variable. All right. So I just want us to, to stop for a second and think if you had not been exposed to these concepts, again, the way that I would do this is probably run 150 calls for the function LM, where I'm changing the Y and the X variable and have 150 objects and then have that as a list to get the R square and do. So very, very, um, I guess, not reproducible, very intensive for you to be creating 150 models where each one of them you're changing, maybe the data, you're changing the Y, changing the X. So to keep, to mentally keep track of that, it's very demanding, it's difficult, it's gonna give you a headache if you were to do it that way, for sure, and it's really prone to error, right? So we're gonna use some of the skills that we're gonna to learn today and do that in a reproducible, efficient way. Okay, so I left you here. The first chunk is just the packages we're gonna be using. I think this install packages NLRAA is just a leftover from a previous script. You don't have to worry about that but just go ahead and run those. So we're gonna be using mostly here uh, functions from the tidyverse and then janitor just to clean our, our variables and then NADAR for some bigger display. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna be coding together here is gonna to be to read in this data. This is a CSV file that we just copied. So we're gonna be using read underscore CSV or read.csv may also work. Open and close quotation marks, dot, dot, far as slash to get outside of the code data or the code folder. We go inside the data folder and we select the nematodes underscore RS. If you run that, it should pop up on your environment. And then if you print it, this is what we get. So we have 43 rows, one row for each observation point. So one row for each point on that field where that student went and took soil and plant samples. And then we have 18 columns. So the first one here is site. This column is site A for all these rows here. Again, we're just working with one of the sites of the paper. We have sample ID, which would be the ID of each one of those 43 samples collected on this field. And then we have this, these variables here. So mel is that meloidogeny or something like that, nematode species name. So the first part here is the nematode species. The second part of the name is it's whether it's for soil or roots. I think we have a underscore R for roots. 
So Mel underscore S, PB and Het are just the, so Mel, PB and Het are just the three different species of nematode that were measured on the samples. S here means that is soil. We have a sum on the soil, which is just the sum of these three represented here. Then we have the same columns, but with underscore R meaning for roots. So these were measured again in the soil and also in the roots of the soybean plants. So we have male PB and hat for roots as well. We have the sum of the nematode counts on the roots. We have the sum total, sum underscore T, which is the total sum for both soil and roots. We have the number of nematode eggs in the roots. We have yield. And then after yield, we have all of the sensor information, which at this point is just reflectance as a percentage in the blue, B stands for blue, G for green, NIR for near infrared, R for red, and RE for red edge. So these are just different bins that we collected data and we extracted those reflectance data points for each one of the points that were sampled in the field for soil and plants. All right, so before we move on, any, any questions, I guess, about the data itself? Any confusion points? Why are the root counts decimal? Uh, this could be some type of averaging that happened at some point. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, these, these are our counts, so they should be integer values, uh, but I'm guessing there's probably some type of averaging of some sort. Maybe they had subsamples and they averaged the values, so that's why they're getting the, the decimal points. How did you get yield in those data location? Uh, so, Sikar, if I remember well from this paper, I think then they may have gotten yield from an adjacent row, perhaps. Um, yeah, I think it may have been an adjacent row because I think that when they sampled the soil and plants destructively, I don't think yield was determined at that point. So it may have been adjacent rows for yield. Yeah, but if you if you're more interested in the actual methodology, you know, there's a link for the paper that you can look into as well. All right. For plants, do you mean buffer? Yeah. So there. So there's a lot of. There is a lot of things I'm kind of not going in detail here because it's not the goal, but really what happened here is part of this analysis. So just so we have some idea here, let me let me pull up my let me pull up a whiteboard here to make a drawing. So really, if you think about like you would have, let's say that this was the field and that we came and took a sample of soil and plants at this point, right? And then we flew with the, with the drone, which en ends up being an image, right? You create an image out of that drone flight with a camera that you have pixels on that image. I'm gonna make an overly large pixel just for uh, interpretation purposes. It's, it would not be this big, right? It would be very small pixel on this field. But let's say that this was the pixel where this point here was sampled and then you have neighboring pixels as well. Wow, my drawing skills are not good thing I'm not an artist. So you have pixels like that, right? I mean continuous pixels all around. So let's say you would come here to this point where you sample plants and you know the GPS location and you would bring in behind it the image that you're looking at. So let's say this image here was for the pixel values here would be for the blue band. So what was done in this paper was to create different sizes of buffer around the point that was sampled. So there was a buffer, that I think it was like a hundred meter buffer. There was one that was 150 and there's one, I think it was 200. Oops. And then the way that the reflectance data was extracted was for each one of these different buffer sizes around the point, all the pixels within a given buffer were then averaged to give the blue reflectance of that the associated with that point. So they shouldn't try different buffer sizes and then, then they ran a whole bunch of models to see 
which which buffer size that was averaging a different number of neighboring pixels would be the most correlated with the response on the field. So what you're seeing actually on the data set is just one of these buffers that was deemed the best. That's the data you're seeing, but I did not I did not get into much of that for this exercise as that was not the goal. But since you asked, that, that's how it was done. All right. <clears throat> So again, I guess just to, to remind you then, we have a total of 18 columns here where the first one is site, simple ID, and then starting on mal S until, really until eggs R, all these columns are related to nematode counts that were sampled on the field from either soils or plants. And then after, then we have yield, and then B, G, N, I, R, R and RE are the sensor data associated with the points in the field. That we're gonna to try to see if there is a correlation between what they saw in the field and what the sensor data was coming as. All right, so we're gonna do a very quick EDA here uh, as that is not the main goal, but I just wanted to explore a little bit some of these variables. So if you just run that chunk, we see here, for example, some of the counts on the soil are ranging from zero, so no nematodes in a given sample, to 76. So this would be 76 nematode individuals in a sample in a given sample. Uh, or I guess it was not in a given sample. This was standardized to some metric of either soil or plant. This would, but anyways, this would be the count on, on a standardized scale. So let's say it was like 76 nematodes in X grams of soil uh, standardized. So 76, 20. We see a lot more of this, this species here. We have a maximum of 920 counts in this specific case. Um, in the roots, we have a larger count for some of those. So we can really have an idea of those counts here um, and just how they range. For yield, I believe this is, was in kilograms per hectare. So we see the impact or the overall distribution of yield as well. Uh, for this field. And then the sensor data is going to be in reflectance. So this would be uh, basically like four, like 4.3 to 5.3% reflectance on the blue, green, infrared, red edge, and or red and red edge. So that's the sensor data. All right, so we just did a quick summary table for EDA. The next thing I want to do for EDA is create a plot. I think plots are really important for us to understand what's going on. So let me tell you here what I want to do. And I will, and we've done something similar to this in the past. So I hope you can think along with me here and develop this code. So what I what I, what I want to do here is have one plot for each one of the nematode and the sensor data where I do a density, like a geome density, that's for the statistical distribution of each one of those data points. So if we look here, this is how we have. So I do not care for sites, I do not care for simple ID, and I do not care for yield, at least for now. Well, I guess, I guess in my code, we actually have yield included there. Yeah, so let's say I just want to not care, I guess, for site and simple ID. But all the other 16 columns in this data set, I want to create a geom density for each one of them. Any thoughts on what would be the first step here to do that? Before we get into ggplots, what is the first step on the data side if I wanted to do that? Select. Select. Okay, we could do that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we could do the select, right? The, but there is a way that we can just overpass that by, by doing something on pivot longer. So we're gonna use here pivot longer. If you remember, there are two functions that reshape your data either from wide to long or from long to wide. Those are called pivot longer, pivot wider. In our case here, what we do wanna have is, I wanna have one column that's gonna give me the variable name. So I wanna have one column that's gonna tell me green all the way down for all the values that are coming from this green column. And then another column that has the name of values where all the values under this current green column are gonna be stored under there. But now we're gonna be doing that for all these columns, right? 
So imagine that in the end, we're going to have one column that's going to say name, and that's going to be green, 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 near infrared, near infrared, red, 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 red edge, and all the nematode variables. And then another column saying value, which is going to be all the values we're seeing right now stacked under each other, right? That's what we're going to do here next. So we can actually plot this the way that I'm thinking. So the first thing here then is do a pivot underscore longer because I want this data to go from wide to long. So we do pivot longer. What we're going to say here is which columns we want to pivot longer. So there is an argument called calls that really the columns I want to pivot longer are everything except site and sample ID. So an easy way to do that, there's many different ways we can do that, but one of them is to say, what's the name of the first column, which is mel underscore s, give it a colon, and then the name of the last column. So we're basically saying all columns between mel, s, and re, including those two. So if you run this, notice that now, so nematode, I just want to print nematode by itself, we have 43 rows. Now, once you pivot this longer, we end up with 688 rows, where now we have all the previous column names under this new column that's called name, and all the previous values under the column called values. Perhaps just for, for visualization purposes, if we just arrange this by name, it may be easier to just visualize that. So I just arrange by name, so we see we should have here 48 entries where the name equals B and we have values associated with them. Because the 43 values that we had before, so if we just browse here, I'm on the fourth, fifth, fifth page here. So this would be 41, 42, 43. These are the first 43 observations. We see they're all related to the B and their values and they it changes for the next one, right? So we just took all those the columns that were side by side and we stack them from from top to bottom. All right, so now with this data that we have, we can get into ggplot. So let's give it a pipe called ggplot. The data coming through is everything before this pipe. For a geom density, we only need the x variable, we don't need to give a y variable because that's calculated by geom density. So here I want to say a yes and say x equals to value. So this column here that has all the values, add a plus, hit return, and let's call geom density. If we run that, this is what we get. So if you think about it, the data points being shown in this plot right here are for all the variables together, right? We're not differentiating between variables yet. There may be a couple of ways we could differentiate between variables, mm -hmm. and I want to focus in one of them. Anyone has any thoughts on what function we would need here to create a plot for each one of the variables? Facet, right? So let's call facet underscore rep, where we give it a tilde and we say name. So if you recall, after we pivot, I'm just gonna print here until we pivot, there is a column name, a column called name. And that's what we're faceting by, is that's how we do it calling that way. So if you run this, this is what you see. So we created a different facet for each one of the levels of the column name. However, something that happens here is that it's taking whichever of these variables here have the widest range, both on the y-axis and on the x-axis, is taking that range and applying for all facets, which may be useful for just one of these plots, and I actually don't even know which one it would be, but it's not useful if it's the same range of y and x is applied to all of them. So for us to fix that, if you come on the facet wrap, it has an argument called scales, and we can say scales equals to three. So it allows each one of the facets to have their own X and Y ranges calculated for that data only. 
So once you do this, you can really see the distribution of those variables. Uh, and we have all of these variables that we ask for. So both the nematode related variables and also the sensor related variables. Right, so maybe something interesting to see here is, um, especially when we look into the nematode variables, we see normally that they are skewed where we have a higher number closer to lower values and then a few very high values towards the end of the tail of that distribution. So that happens for most of the nematode variables if you look at it. On the other side, if you look at yield is more a little bit more normal distributed, normally distributed. If you look at the sensor data as well, so near for red, red edge, red, blue, and green, they also are a little bit more normally distributed. They're not as skewed as the nematode counts. So just a quick look into these variables and their distribution just on that EDA part of this. All right, so we brought in this data, we understood what the data is, we understood the data distribution. Now, the first step in our desired workflow, so remember that we want to calculate the indices and then run all possible models, 150 models, select the best, and then make some plots out of that. Hey, Dr. Okay. Masters? Yes. I missed that last line of code. I'm sorry. Could you scroll back up just for real quick? Yeah. Uh, thanks. Yep. All right. So the next step here is to calculate different vegetation indices. If you're not familiar with remote sensing, um, you know, you don't really have to be to understand what we're doing, but really the sensor collects data on the bands, right? So bands would be red, blue, green, uh, red edge and infrared, so five bands. Now, vegetation indices are really just formulas that each that there are many vegetation indices. Maybe the most common, most popular you may have heard is NDVI, but there are many more than just NDVI, and they're all just different ways of combining different bands into one number. That's what a vegetation index is, and then normally we want we hope that they would relate better to certain plant parameters than just the bands themselves. So I'm giving you here the example of the formula for NDVI. Uh, this is the overall formula where NDVI is just really you're taking the reflectance of the near infrared band minus the reflectance on one of the bands on the visible spec part of the spectrum, which in the visible here, we would refer to them as red, blue, green, and red edge, even though red edge is not quite visible, but that for our purpose here, we can assume it is within the range. So it takes the reflectance on infrared minus reflectance in one of those bands. So let's say red, dividing that by infrared plus that same band, uh, the reflectance of that same visible band. So this is the overall formula of this vegetation index. If you think of NDVI, the most popular one used, it would be infrared here, and then the visible band would be the red band. So infrared is NDVI, popular one, is near infrared minus red, near infrared plus red. However, this overall formula of this vegetation index, we can apply to different bands, where normally you would still keep near infrared as the first one here, but then the visible band could be any of the blue, green, red, red edge. Right, so if I do, so if normally if you hear NDVI, it means that the visible band here is the red, but there is, but you can calculate the blue NDVI, which instead of having the red has the blue band or the green NDVI or the red edge, or the NDVI red edge or NDRE, which it has the red edge instead of the, of the red band on the VIS position here. All right, so let's say uh, that I wanted to calculate the NDVI on this data that we're working with here. Or so the, the red NDVI, so the NDVI that uses near infrared and red, all right? So if you come on the next chunk here, we're just gonna use a pipe. We're not even gonna save this to an object. We're just gonna print the output just to visualize what it would be. So if we create here um, a column, so I wanna create a column where I calculate the red NDVI. So let's call mutate. I wanna call this 
column here R NDVI to mean NDVI using the red bin as the visible bin. It really is just that formula, right? So we open and close parentheses. We say NIR minus R. You get outside of that parentheses, add a division, open another parentheses, NIR plus R. And just to remind you, the reason why we're using NIR and R here is because we have columns with those names in our data, right? If those columns were named something else, maybe uppercase NIR, we would have to match that. So just wanted to show you here. We have a column called NIR and a column called R that is stand for meaningful red and red. That's why this formula works. So if you run this and you just scroll to the side, all the way to the side, now we have a new column that's the red and DVI. This is the result of that calculation for each one of the rows. All right. So what I wanna do next is to calculate this formula, but I wanna change the R column here. So the red band, I wanna have another NDVI here that it would be the blue instead of the red, and then the green instead of the red, and then the red edge instead of the red. As you can see, we're gonna be repeating some of this code here. We're gonna be repeating this formula where the, really the only difference is gonna be that R band is gonna be something else at each one of the steps. There is this quote uh, from someone famous, I don't know who, that said, if you are repeating your code at least twice, think of creating a function to automate that. I don't do that myself a lot of the times, uh, maybe because, you know, I don't know, maybe I get a little bit lazy and I just type from my head, but it is a good practice and I wanna show you how we would do that here, right? So we're realizing that we're gonna be copying and pasting this formula many times, just changing that second variable there, which right now is R, gonna be changing that to be other bands. So that you know is a, is a potential place where we can create a function for us to do that instead. So I wanna invite you to come to the next chunk here and we're gonna create a function where I wanna call this function NDVI. Now we're gonna start talking about how we put together a function, how that works and um, how we we're gonna implement this. So the first thing we're given here is the function name is gonna be NDVI. We give the assignment symbol and then we have to call this function that is called function. I know that's kind of confusing, but inside here, we're, so inside of this function function, we need to say what are the inputs that we're gonna to give to this function. And these do not have to be exactly the name of the variables you have in your data. These could be X and Y, it could be A, B, right? It, it does not have to be near infrared and something else, right? It can be any name. For us to make this a little bit more intuitive, I do wanna name this inputs of this function as near as NIR and this. So what I'm saying here is that this function that I'm creating that's gonna have the name NDVI, this function is gonna be expecting two arguments. One of them, the, internally, the function is gonna name NIR. The second one is gonna internally name VIS for visible. Now you open and close curly brackets, just break code a little bit there, because we're gonna now determine what this function is gonna do with those two inputs. So really, we're just gonna type the formula of NDVI again, which is, if you open parentheses, is gonna be NIR minus this in this case, right? Because now this is just a placeholder for any band that you give it. it, does not have to be the red band, right? So this is just a placeholder for that visible band. So near infrared minus this divided by open parentheses again, near infrared plus this. And then because this is the only thing this function is doing, it will give you back the result of this. This is what's gonna to return to you. Now, why am I calling this NIR and this this? Is it because my data frame has those columns? No, I'm calling, so these are the way that I am saying the name of the arguments that this function receives. And I have to use these names here on the function body so it knows. This is the input coming in, this is how I'm gonna use it, right? So if I come here and I name this 
something like that, it's not going to work because I the function does not know where this is coming from, right? So this name here on the body of the function has to match the name of the input. So if I had named this A and B, this would have to be A and B, right? I just want to keep name for right and this because I think that makes it more intuitive. All right, so now if you just run this chunk, this function is made available in your environment. So if you were to inspect there, you're gonna see the NDVI right there. And if you just print this object NDVI, it's gonna tell you exactly what it is. A function with two argument, two input arguments, name for add and this, and this is how those arguments are being used. And it gives you back the result of that calculation. Right, so we have the function name being NDVI, the way that R knows you're you're creating a function and not just an object is because we're using this function function, where inside of it we give the arguments. On the body of the function, we show how those arguments are being used. And because this is the only thing happening in this function, it will give you back the results of that calculation. All right, so previously, let me just show you the previous chunk here. This is how we calculated the R and DVI before. We had, we use column names, right? So remember NIR and, and R are column names. So now, I, I guess I just wanna copy this for you to see and compare how it's gonna change now. So if you come here, let me just give a few, I wanna add this as a comment so it does not actually run, just so for us to compare. But let's say you come on this, on this, next, on this next chunk, the one after we created the function, we come here on nematode, we give it a pipe, we give again a mutate. I want to still call this RNDVI. So now the way that we are gonna call this function is calling the function name, right? So which we gave the name of NDVI, NDVI. And remember that the function NDVI requires two vectors, one containing the data on the near infrared one containing the data on the visible band, whichever one you want to give it. So because our data set has a column called near infrared, we just give NIR to begin with. And the second one here, because I'm calculating the red in DVI, I give it the red band. So if I run that, it will calculate and give to me this new column called R in DVI, where it's just a product or the output of that function. Right. This should be exactly the same as what we did on the previous chunk, which is with this code here. It's just that now we generalized this formula of the NDVI. And now if I want to apply this formula to any other version of NDVI where you would have a different visible band, it's going to be a little bit simpler, a little bit easier. All right. Any, any questions about that? Okay. So if you're yeah. looking for a different band, so in this case, so we just need to change that. Like if we are looking for the blue band, so instead of how we manage the service, it's gonna automatically mean that when you from the part of the blue band, right? Yeah, so we're gonna do that in the next step here. Uh, but yeah, so if we wanted to calculate the green in DVI, we would just come here and change this. Or did I say green? Yeah, green. Yeah. It just changes to green, right? And we have a column that's called G. But when this gets into the function, it puts that G in place of this, right? And then it just fits in there. Yep. Like if you any day, like you can create a function function that front of end you also change it automatically. What do you mean the front? So like now you're writing uh, R and DBA, B and DBA. If you just change in the second, it automatically comes in the first. There's probably a way to do that. Um, yeah, we're not going to cover that just because we start bringing too many complexities at once. And I think that's an easy way to lose you all. So I'm introducing one complexity at a time. But we're going to do something not exactly that, but we're going to be using loops to do something that will resemble what you would do to do what you're asking. So Armando is asking if there is a way that we can 
automatically name this column that we're giving the name RNDVI just based on whatever band we give here. I told him that there, there probably is a way, uh, but it would add more complexity at this point, and I don't want to overwhelm you with complexity. But yeah, so this would be the way that we would generalize that NDVI formula and just calculate this easily by just changing what what is the what is the visible band you want as part of that of that formula. Okay, so if you come here on the next chunk, we're going to do exactly that. So remember that that was one of the goals here was to calculate I think ten different vegetation indices, where some of them follow the NDVI formula. So for the ones that do follow the NDVI formula, we're going to handwrite them here uh, on this chunk. So if you go on that nematode, you add the uh, pipe, and then you come after this comment here. So after calculating NDVI base indices, we're going to call this a mutate, where again, we're going to ask for the red NDVI. So our NDVI is going to be equals to then the function that we named NDVI, and we're going to give it an infrared as the first argument, the red band as the second argument. Still inside of this mutate here, so if you just get after the parentheses closing the NDVI function, you just add a comma, give break code a few times. We're going to be repeating this four times where the first one is going to be, or the next one, sorry, is going to be the green NDVI. So let's call that G NDVI. That's going to be equals to the function NDVI, where the first argument remains in infrared. The second one becomes G for green. And then remember that G is a column in our data. That's why we can provide it that way. Now give it another comma. We're going to do the next one for the blue NDVI. So B NDVI equals to function NDVI, where we give the name for red, comma, B for the blue band. And then lastly, we're going to do this for the red edge band. So we're going to call this RE for red edge, RE NDVI equals to NDVI formula, where the first argument is NIR, the second one is RE. And RE, again, is a column in our data set, and that's why it works. And then make sure, so make sure you have your commas right after the end of each one of the lines, except the last one. Make sure you're closing your parentheses of the NDVI function. Make sure that at the end, you also close the parentheses of the mutate function. That should get you in the right shape. If you run this, so just until here, and then you just print the nematode W at the end. Now we're going to see that we have, we started off with 18 columns. Now we have 22. That's because if you browse all the way to the right, you're going to see all the NDVI indices we calculated. So the red, green, blue, and red edge. All right. So the, the, on the paper, we calculated other vegetation indices, and I just want to include them here just, just for, for this exercise. I did not, I'm not going to explain to you what they are, what they mean, how they're different, other than telling you they have different names and they're combining bands in different ways as well. If you do want to more, know more about why these bands, who invented, or why these vegetation indices, what, what is the scientific reference of whoever invented them and so on, you can refer back to the paper that uh, I gave you a link at the beginning of the script. So if you just add a pipe here, I want to ask you to remove the hashtag starting on the mutate, right? So allow that entire mutate to go through. So here we're calculating this uh, SR is for simple ratio, which is just the ratio of near infrared and red. And then RDVI, SAVI, VERI, EVI, and L NLI are just, again, different formulas using different, one, different combinations of bands to calculate those indices. All right, so if you just run this whole chunk and you just let it go through, I hope you did not get any errors. If you print it now, we have 28 columns which is because of all those extra vegetation indices we calculated. All right, any, any questions? 
about until this point. All right, I think we can go one more step here in the script and then we can take, we can stop for today. We're going to 1110 today. All right, so now we have all these 28 rows, or I'm sorry, 28 columns, a lot of sensor based data, right? So let's say that I wanted to calculate uh, some statistical summary of all of these columns that we that we created. And specifically, let's say I wanted to know the mean and the coefficient of variation. If you remember, I mean, there are different ways of doing this. I want to show you one way that we could create a function that would help us with that. So let's say that, um, you know, I wanted the mean and the coefficient of variation. And if you recall, R does not have a function for CV. You have to kind of calculate that by hand, which is basically just dividing the standard deviation by the mean, that's the CV, but R does not have a function for that. So we can perhaps try to create our own function and have that as part of that, that function. So if you come here to this next chunk, here's what I want this, this to be. I wanna, I wanna create this new function called mean CV. It's gonna be a function that I give it a vector. So let's say I give it a column of values. It would be perhaps you know, one of the bands or one of the vegetation indices. And I want it to give back to me the mean and the coefficient of variation of that column. That's what I want to get back out of this function. So let's start uh, creating this function now. So again, mean CV is the name of the function. So we just give the assignment symbol and we call the function function, which is the one we use to create the function. And here really, I just need to give it one argument or one piece of information, which I wanna call this X. It could have been called A, B, C, whatever. I wanna call this X. It's just important to know what we're calling at that level because that's how we're going to refer to this inside of the function body. So after uh, giving that, that function X, open curly brackets, it's gonna open and close for you. I want I ask you to leave the opening where it is, but bring the closing curly bracket to the end after the after the the last comment right there. So in between the curly brackets is where we're going to develop this function. All right. So the first thing I want this function to do for us is to calculate the mean of x, where x is a vector of values that I'm given it. So Internally here, I want to create an object inside of this function that I want to call mean. And this object is going to be the mean of x, where it knows what x is because it is what's, what the function is receiving as the argument. That's what x is. And I just want to have the na.rn equals true. If you remember, any of these statistical summary functions, if you have nas in it and you don't remove them, it's going to give an na back. This is just to avoid the problem. The next step here is I want to calculate the standard deviation. So let's call that SD. That's going to be the function called SD as well. And again, I want to say SD of X, where X is just a placeholder for whatever argument you give when you call this function. I just want to say NA.RM equals true as well. Now, if you come here after the second comment, this is where we're going to calculate the coefficient of variation. I want to create also an object here. So that's going to be CV. And really CV is just, if you open and close parentheses, it's just the standard deviation that we calculated above divided by the mean times 100. That's what CV is. And then because my original goal was for this function here to give me both the mean and the CV, I wanted to create a data frame and give me back a data frame with those two columns. So for that, if you come here after the, the this, this comment, the combine them into a data frame comment, I wanna call this data frame df, where we call the function data.frame to create a data frame, where it's gonna have a column called mean, and that column is gonna be equals to this object called mean. So the first mean here is the name of the column in this data frame. 
The second mean here refers to the object that's creating inside of the function. And then similarly, if you give a comma and break code, I wanted to have to have a column called CV that's going to be equals to this CV object inside of the function. And because we created multiple things on this function, so we created one, two, three, four objects, I need to tell it what is the object I want the function to return back to me. There are a couple of different ways of doing this, but if you just call again the object that you want back, it's gonna do that for you. All right, so just quickly recap here. We are creating a function called mean CV that it takes one argument. That argument is gonna be the, a whole bunch of numbers, a vector of numbers that we want the mean of the standard deviation in the CV is gonna then create a data frame that it combines the mean in the CV. That's what we want out of this function. And then it's gonna return us back that, that data frame. So if you run this from the beginning and you just print to main CV, you're gonna see it is a function, right? It's gonna print as a function. All right, so, so let's say that I wanted to know the mean and the CV of the red NDVI column. So a very simple way for us to call that would be calling the, the function first. So the function that we just created is called mean CV. And then here we give a vector, right? So in this case here, we can call the, the data name, which is nematode underscore W, use the dollar sign notation to only get one of those columns. And I wanna get the RNDVI column. So if I were just to print nematode dollar sign RNDVI, I would get this vector here, which is all the values of red NDVI inside of the data. So I'm, this is what I'm giving as the X value of this function. If you just run that function with that inside of it, you get back a data frame with the mean and the CV. Right? So that's exactly what we asked for this function to do is to get that vector X, calculate mean, SD, use that, calculate the CV, put that into a data frame, return us that data frame. So this is what it's doing for us. All right, I think this is a good stopping point uh, in the next, or in the next class, we're gonna go through this exercise and finish it. We're gonna see two ways of doing iterate. So we just saw how to create functions and how to apply your custom-made functions, right? On Thursday, we're gonna see how we can uh, do this to first iterate using loops and then iterate using list mapping, which is, if you've never seen this, is gonna be, I think, a very interesting concept to learn. All right, uh, so we're stopping here today. Any questions about any of this? All right, I don't hear anything, so let me get your attendance on GitHub. All right, so make sure you claim your attendance. Also, I think I, I forgot to ask you this last time. Make sure you stage, commit, and push on this project. So go on your Git tab, stage all of that. And then, let's see, where's the commit? Commit, you can say, you know, partially works on iteration script. Commit, and then make sure you push as well. So you have those changes reflected on your GitHub repo. After, after you stage, commit and push and claim your attendance, you're good to go. Thanks everyone, see you Thursday.